Chinese President Xi Jinping delivered a speech on China's cyber power at a national conference last week outlining online opportunities and hurdles ahead. How will this blueprint launch greater influence in cyberspace and foster core technologies at home? And the U.S. released its 2017 country reports on human rights practices, the first under the Trump administration. With its own human rights flaws, how can the U.S. claim to lead the world by example? Welcome to The Point, live from Beijing, I'm Li Xin. Chinese President Xi Jinping gave a speech at the National Cybersecurity and Informatization World Conference in Beijing last Friday and Saturday. Seen as a blueprint for developing China's strengths in cyberspace, his speech addressed a broad bandwidth of issues including how to prevent the Internet from spreading harmful information, protecting users' privacy and achieving more breakthroughs in core information technologies. With over 70 million Internet users and a digital economy that reached some 4.3 trillion U.S. dollars last year, almost a third of the country's GDP, China is embracing monumental online opportunities and also facing complex challenges. What kind of messages has President Xi sent in terms of safeguarding China's cybersecurity and upgrading its core technology development and in light of the US government's ban on US businesses selling key parts to ZTE a major Chinese telecommunications company how is China beefing up its homegrown technologies in the sector joining me for the discussion today in Beijing is associate professor Helen Song director of the AI lab at the Beijing Institute of Graphic Communication and in Nanjing professor John Gong from the University of International Business and economics. Welcome to both of you. Um, Professor Song, uh, right from the beginning, President Xi, in his speech, stressed the need to keenly grasp the historical opportunity in informatization development and move forward the construction of a cyber power through indigenous innovation. What kind of opportunities did he mean? I think it is the first time for the um, Chinese government to recognize the digital economy as a major force to grow the uh, national economy. And I think that's very um, exciting for um, people like me who work in this area uh, because um, many people, well, possibly including uh, some leaders in other countries, wouldn't take that. Uh, um, importance of the new technology in the overall development of uh, the country. And President Xi's remark obviously gave this very significant um, position to the digital economy and confirmed that uh, we are um, we are leading our way into the new economy mm -hmm. in the new era, and mm -hmm. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Professor Gong, um, what kind of historical, yes. historical opportunities uh, did President Xi want to refer to? Um, I think he is referring to the, you know, the opportunity that China's uh, internet uh, development as well as its you know, information technology has come to a crossroad that uh, uh, you know, he emphasizes the, the, the potential of doing indigenous innovation that uh, as the economy um, uh, is going to you know, further grow and our information technology and also our network uh, industry is going to expand greatly. Uh, and you know he emphasizes a lot about uh, uh, innovation. Um, and just to add a note to a mm -hmm. previous question, mm -hmm. um, he mentioned I, I got two messages, very important messages away from his his speech. Mm -hmm. One is he mentioned in, the, the importance of policy. That is, you know, that means it means to me that we are not going to give up. You know, this in, industrial policy thing that the, the Section 301 report has been so critical of. I think uh, you know this is something we're going to continue to do. The second thing is that he talked about the system approach. Uh, that means China should be able to develop um, innovation capabilities uh, and also indigenous technologies in a systematic way throughout the whole value chain. So I think that's a very strong message, and that uh, we're going to see more and more you know strong investment by the Chinese government in these areas. Right. Indeed, he dedicated uh, a whole paragraph on uh, core technologies, calling it a great matter of the state. So, Professor Sun, why did he put so much emphasis on this right now? 
Well, possibly because of that uh, um, both people inside China and outside China will felt that uh, China is really hiding towards the number one in this new competition or for new technology. And, um, um, but some people might be worrying that uh, we um, didn't really um, have the control over the core technology. And I think um, the way that President Xi put it is you know, it's not one or two particular um, piece of technology, for example, a particular piece of hardware. It's we are really tackling the core technology to, for, for our development. So I think that is uh, very important. Um, but obviously from the recent news, like people's attention will be mostly on uh, the ZTE case um, and feel worrying about it. But, um, uh, but I think presidency gave uh, actually higher view instead of just focus on one piece of hardware. And, and we are actually developing the core technology and that will include the hardware, but also include transmission technology, include including um, all the other associated factors around that piece of technology. Mm -hmm. How do you look at the fact that he didn't mention ZTE by name, he didn't mention it, this case uh, in, in the slightest trace, but he tried to address this, this question from a different uh, level of strategy maybe? I think that's very wise, that's very wise because the case of that TEA um, has many factors associated with it. It's not really about a piece of hardware, it's really about how an uh, entrepreneur decides to run a company in different times, you know, they make different decisions. And I think from the government point of view, it's actually more important to concentrate on our t core technology instead of just to say, you know, we try to solve a particular uh, problem of a particular enterprise. Um, and if we have developed the core technology, um, and then the case of ZTE might still happen. <laughs> um, and might not happen uh, because Huawei said um, in one of the occasions, uh, you know, said that the reason why they develop so much um, IPs by themselves, that's because they don't want to um, have the fear that they are controlled by anybody. But if it's cheaper to buy those technology or hardwares from other wares, they will still keep buying instead of, you know, using their own. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think President Xi really touched the core of the problem. It's not about a particular company. It's about we need to focus on the core technology that we need to come right. into a new age. All right, Professor yeah, Gong. I, I, may, I may want to, sorry. Absolutely, go ahead. Yeah, you want to make a point. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I just want to add a note that uh, I don't think it's appropriate for uh, President Xi to uh, specifically mentioned this company ZTE uh, at a venue like this. I mean, the, you know, we have to keep in mind that uh, you know ZTE was violating a U.S. sanctioned domestic law against Iran, and they actually plead, uh, made a criminal um, uh, pr uh, made a pre bargain uh, 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 in, in a criminal case actually. Uh, uh, you know, in, in July, sorry, in March of 2017, and you know, I think the case with ZTE, in my opinion, is whether you know the the US Department of Commerce is really trying to penalize a company or trying to trying to kill it yeah. I think the yeah uh, the, the question I want the question I want to follow up here is uh, professor gong do you think uh, president xi is addressing the core of the issue by coming up with concrete solutions to so that this kind of uh, over dependence on imported technology uh, is is not the case in the future anymore Oh yeah, of course. I mean, the the the, the bottom line of whole of, of all these things is that, of course, China needs to develop our own indigenous uh, technology capability, such that you know the one of the the the, the weapons the U.S. government has been using uh, is just going to be non-existent uh, if we had the capability to develop these DSP chip, these these RF chips, these you know these very critical uh, uh, IC uh, products that can be uh, used in our telecommunications equipment. You know this this issue just go away. There's no way that U.S. government can uh, really cripple, you know, the city as a, as a company. I mean, all they can do is probably, you know, kick them out of the U.S. market. I guess they most uh, can do, but that's not a big deal. <coughs> so right. I think the bottom line is still that we need to develop a set of uh, core technologies uh, really going upstream uh, in R&D into these 
you know, really critical technologies at the, at the IC level. I mean, this is the most important. I think I also want to mention that uh, it's not just IC design and production, also the, the equipment that goes towards producing these IC products. This is really sort of the, the, the jewel and the crown of U.S. technological prowess. I mean, it's very much controlled by uh, one U.S. company called Applied Material, uh, and the U.S. government has a very strict export technology control of uh, these uh, these technologies and products, Chinese companies just don't have their access uh, to to products. Uh, so, from what is what material. would be China's path to um, to tackle that problem? You have this strict control from the U.S. government on these uh, sensitive technology, but on the other hand, uh, I understand that it takes years, right, for any country to right. independently have their indigenous core technology. So, Professor Song, uh, what is the likelihood that China will be able to make that significant jump? anytime soon. Well, um, I actually want to add something to the question um, just now, uh, but that will answer this question as well. And I think instead of really being led too much about uh, what other countries or even the technology, uh, technology area think what is the techn uh, core technology, we should also look back into what we want to develop, what will benefit our economy, what will benefit our growth. You know, I have closely followed all the news in recent um, weeks, and I think there, there is a danger that we could be mis mis misled by some reason. For example, um, we all know that um, you know, all those chip companies like Broadcom, they, they're not really very strong at the moment um, in their overall financial performance. And, um, and then everything becomes suddenly uh, become very important. Um, and my little worry is actually whether it is a real need uh, because I don't really think that the U.S. will ban everything, you know, not selling to any Chinese company. But uh, if we become too nervous, if we become, um, you know, valued too much, then that might give further difficulties um, if we try to negotiate a deal or if we try to create something by ourselves. Uh, you know, then people will become too sensitive. So, so myself is actually um, supporting to tune down this uh, uh, immediate need because we, we are still, you know, having everything we need. We are still growing our 5G. We, are pre we were predicted to be the number one in the ranking of a 5G era. So I think over, um, over cautious or, or, or being too nervous will actually um, gave the opportunities to some misleading judgments. Um, and, and especially in recent weeks, you'll you see uh, different Chinese companies suddenly start to make those acquisition deals, you know, for, right. for, for There the is the danger there. Yeah. Um, Professor Gong, you wanted to say something. Ten seconds, can you make yeah, it? Well, yeah, well, you know, we are gonna, we're going to be ranked number one in terms in 5G area in terms of deployment, but not in terms of uh, technology development as well as uh, uh, production of equipment. I mean, the, most of the, uh, uh, although you know, in 5G standard settings, I know that Huawei has has occupied a very large space, but you know, in terms of the most critical chips, it's still going to be a game played by Qualcomm. Um, so you can't, and, but and you can't rush companies. on that matter. I think that's what Professor Sun was talking about, right? It, it will take time. Right. So for the immediate right. future, I, I, I yeah, people right. still. And I totally agree with that. We can't produce everything. I mean, that would be, that would be, uh, you know, we, we, right. it's, it's really not going to be emphasizing on trade. But I think it is one very good example I want to mention, though. Look at the high-speed railroad. I mean, as far as I understand, uh, the high-speed railroad industry in China is able to produce every single parts and components in the system. But that right. doesn't that mean that very the companies... That is a very well, interesting story. Let me finish. <laughs> and yeah, very, but, but, I but, but, have but, but, to leave it there. Professor Gong, oh, okay, I have okay. to leave it there. Um, we'll talk about the high-speed train some other time. Many thanks to my two guests, Professor, Associate Professor Helen Son, Director of the AI Lab at the Beijing Institute of Graphic Communication, and Professor John Gong, joining us from Nanjing. He's from the University of International Business and Economics. You're watching The Point. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us.
Last Friday, the U.S. State Council released its 2017 country reports on human rights practices. It is the 42nd such report, but the first under President Donald Trump. Detailing human rights in virtually every country and territory around the world except the U.S. itself, the report emphasized human rights violations in certain countries such as China and Russia, but uses apparently softer language for U.S. allies. The report called China and Russia forces of instability. The report, of course, drew criticism from governments around the world, but also from human rights groups within the U.S. for some glaring omissions about the U.S.'s own activities at home and abroad. China will also release its annual response on the human rights situation in the U.S. on Tuesday. So what's wrong with this report in the eyes of governments targeted? Are there no human rights violations in the United States? If not, how can it claim to lead the world by example? Joining me today for the discussion are Aina Tangan, current affairs commentator, and Xu Qingdu, senior a fellow of the Pangal Institution. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Aina, how do you look at this report? Well, unfortunately, it's, it's kind of a hypocritical joke. Um, it's become an enemies list. Basically, anybody uh, who's on that list is somebody who's not friendly to the United States. And but it's, it's targeting, it's, it's talking about almost every single country and every territory around the world except the United States. Oh, well, uh, the U.S. does not uh, review its own uh, actions and things like that. And if you, if you start looking at the human rights groups uh, across uh, the world, they all have criticisms. Everything from, um, you know, how they're treating uh, people in wartime atrocities, uh, uh, unilateral actions to bomb, you know, with missiles. Uh, all, I mean, there's really not much out that isn't on that list, the incarceration. We have the highest level of incarceration in the world. Uh, if you start looking at the number of youths who are in there, there's almost a, a poverty, uh, a debtor's prison type of atmosphere. It, it really has become uh, quite difficult. And this is the difficulty. I mean, the U.S. cannot lead by example if it has this kind of thing. That's why it's but are they not aware that they have these problems? I mean, they participate in all kinds of international dialogue to improve the human rights situation, and yet it seems that, you know, it's okay just to... Well, you, I think you have to separate, uh, you know, the leadership, current leadership from, quote, the American people. I think there is some uh, anxiety about it. Unfortunately, the anxiety is driving the kind of fear and hatred that's out there. I mean, Donald Trump, uh, the, m the number of incidences involving race, uh, white supremacy, these types of things have increased uh, since he's been ramping up his rhetoric about how, you know, immigrants are rapists and criminals and we have to get rid of them. Uh, he's playing to this kind of nativist um, dialogue that's out there. And this is it. He's driving his own popularity and populism with uh, this kind of hatred and fear. So it, it's not unexpected, and it's not unexpected that he would take out important issues like uh, women's rights, uh, the rights of children, uh, many other areas where he just said, look, I, we don't care. I mean, it was well, quite anyway, the United States uh, has a historic problem with uh, uh, children's rights, with women's rights. I mean, it's one of the few developed countries that is not signature to many of these international conventions on, on the protection of, uh, of the rights yeah. of these group of people. But what, um, how does China, the, the Chinese government see this report, the, well, 40, the 42nd edition? You know, there are many years, you know, there are a lot of criticism from the Chinese side. Obviously, uh, Chinese uh, government see it as a, a politically motivated uh, you know, document, basically using the human rights record as a political tool to attack your enemies, basically. And uh, in particular, in this report, you can see that uh, I can't see it more clearer. Uh, basically, you know, all those countries uh, consider as the U.S. allies. They are soft languages. And then to China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, they are the forces of instabilization. That's if you forces look at forces of instability. Instability. Right. If you look at the Twitter account, uh, you know, uh, with the news, and if you look at the response, almost completely exclusively 100% critical of the U.S. who attacked Iraq without the U.N. mandate with fake evidence, who attacked Libya, uh, Libya who attacked Syria without the U.N. mandate, and, uh, you know, in the Iraq war, basically, you know, tens of thousands of people, innocent people were killed. Anybody held uh, accountable? No. 
That's a violation well, of human would rights. Say, people would say, look, China, you do have a lot of human rights violations, or, you know, uh, in Russia, there are a lot of human rights violations. What's wrong with pointing them out? No problem. You know, every country, no country is perfect. I think China admits its own problem. Uh, I think the U.S. should also look at the mirror probably at itself. That is a problem. The U.S. is basically criticizing everybody. You guys are ugly. Well, itself refuse. Uh, refusing looking at the mirror, yeah. I think that's that's the problem. The, 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 you know, and also for developing countries like China, India, and other big powers, developing countries they have different priorities. I think the definition people are basically saying, you know, we have different definition about human rights. For the Western countries, it's stress more about political rights, about your, you know, your rights to vote, your rights to election, your rights to uh, uh, freedom of speech. For mm -hmm. people living in the developing countries, I think a lot of them priority is really to get well fed, well closed, you know, poverty reduction. Yeah, you know, there's know. another aspect to this. Uh, I mean, we've been involved in trying to influence elections. We have NGOs that are, are actually, you know, extensions of our, our um, uh, spy <laughs> groups like that, and w we've been pushing this. So, once you have uh, both Russia, Russia said, "Okay, you interfere with our election." He, uh, Putin accused Hillary Clinton of being involved in trying to uh, destabilize uh, the, the election again, uh, against him. Uh, they said, "Okay, fair is fair. We will fight back." With China, the U.S. is, you know, as you can see from the rhetoric from this administration, they, they, they painted China as evil. They're, they're out there now saying the Belt and Road Initiative, and as opposed to being a win-win initiative, is, is simply a colonialization of the world. I mean, you're, you're hearing all of this rhetoric. So China has reacted and said, listen, we have to protect our cybersecurity, and there are going to be sacrifices to that. I mean, it's not easy. To, there is a, a firewall. There are other issues. Mm -hmm. But China feels that it's in a situation where it has to protect itself. So the more the U.S. pushes on this, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If things were open, the U.S. took a hands-off uh, approach to these things, I think you would have a much uh, more uh, open World. Well, um, another very important uh, uh, message that people from outside read about is the, the, the apparent uh, double standards. The, mm -hmm. you know, um, for instance, there are a lot of uh, uh, details that are omitted from some of the countries that uh, are either U.S. ally or um, where the United States is supporting some military actions, such as the situation in Yemen. What is the explanation behind such? Uh, uh, purpose, um, you know, keeping uh, a... I mean, if you, if you read through the, the press uh, report, Sullivan spoke first and then he had uh, his uh, ambassador, Kudlow, I think, uh, responding. He just didn't quite seem able to answer any questions about Israel. And, you know, obviously this is something that the world is concerned about. Right, the, the Occupied Territory is language changed. is changed to Golan Heights, West Bank and Gaza. What does that mean? That means that if you're a friend of the United States, you can be excused from anything, and this is what I'm saying. It's a hypocritical enemies list. Basically, they have uh, thrown aside any attempt to be fair and balanced about this and judge it according to any kind of standard and just said, look, if we don't like you, you're a human rights violator. If we do like you, you're not. Because they don't, they don't mention Somalia, Sudan. I mean, yeah. none I mean, of these me, areas this is, are This has gone mentioned. to a level. This has gone to a level that is really just. Uh, um, there's no shame in this. I mean, it's whatever the. It's laughable. I see it like yeah, it's, it's laughable. It's laughable. I mean, it's a mockery. Kind of, yeah, I, I do <laughs> not know. But why? How can they suppose that people can read this and still believe that they're doing the right thing? As That's I said, you know. The, I They've lost credibility on this. This report has, in, in effect, ended any credibility that this report has had in the past. However, it has always been the U.S.'s, I don't know, they see it upon them to lead the world in a moral, you know, to, to be on the moral high ground, even if there are human rights violations. It is their responsibility to come up with, the, with a complete picture for mm. all all over the world. That's the, what is, that's what the is ugly behind? side of American exceptionalism, this idea that the United States, no matter what it does, because it is defending uh, democracy, 
uh, and you know, a, a liberal democ democratic capitalism that anything is fair, that the ends justify the means. I mean, this is the same rhetoric that was used by Adolf Hitler. We don't care who gets hurt in between. We are simply trying to establish law and order that can be unified the world and end all conflict. If you, if you remember the hearing of uh, Pompeo, the CIA director to be the Secretary of State, right, in the Senate, uh, basically what he said is like our interference in uh, domestic affairs of other countries in terms of election, you know, that's normal and that's wholly a cause. And other is countries there a religious factor to this? <laughs> I mean, ideological. There, there, there's a religious and an ideological. The religious one you can see in the criticisms of China where they were, they were saying that, you know, Christians are being uh, persecuted, mm -hmm. that things, you know, this is at the same time that China is uh, ne uh, negotiating a detente with the, uh, the Catholic Church and the Pope. So it's, it's simply, I mean, people throw away any reason. There's no reason really to talk about this. It has simply become a mockery, an enemies list. How do the American people look at this? I really they don't pay attention to it. They don't pay attention to this. No. So they just let this, this go on, and this is the 42nd year, and the, the, the mockery will go on, and China will publish its own and response, right? In, in particular, this year is a mockery, I would say. I have sympathy for Mr. Sullivan, the acting Secretary of State, when he said that, like, you know, the uh, U.S. is supposed to lead by example around the world. No, I, I'm, you know, uh, I'm not sure like whether he's sincere to say that you know, on behalf of the U.S. administration and the leadership of Donald Trump. Uh, no, I, 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 don't feel, I don't feel sorry for him. He's going along. He's acquiescing in this. What he's undermining is, the credibility of the United is, States. What is the right way to deal with this matter, to, to dialogue? among the nations. On, on I, you the know, it, it's, 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 it's very simple. Lead by example. Don't tell others and preach what should, you should do. If you really want a better to world, really lead, lead by example, lead by example mm -hmm. and do what you want pe others to do. Walk the walk. And also, I think uh, you should take into consideration of other countries who have, which have a different political system, different cultural background, and also do it in the UN framework. Right. Okay, uh, which is already existing. Many thanks to my two guests, Aina Tang and current affairs commentator, and Xu Qingdu, a senior fellow of the Pango Institution. Here is my quick point. I think it's a pity that the reports don't talk about the human rights problems the U.S. suffers from, such as lack of basic universal health care, rampant gun violence, outrageous police brutality, racism, sexism, and so on. The Trump administration might have done the right thing not to talk about itself in the report, because that would make it really difficult for it to lead by example in front of the rest of the world. China will release its annual response to the U.S. Human Rights White Paper on Tuesday, which can hopefully fill the gap purposely left by the U.S. government. Don't do to others what you don't want done to you. Unfortunately, the U.S. government does not seem to understand this point. That's all for this edition of The Point with me, Li Xin. As always, follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with Alex. Download the application called CGTN to watch our show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.